Hey there internet friends, we've looked at a couple of different ways to get a picture onto your screen when you want to calibrate uh, against some reference colors and some reference images. Um, the first few videos looked at just a really simple way of getting HDMI out of the laptop that I calibrate on and pointing that to a screen um, through some sort of you know converter, a HDMI to um, either RGB or uh, YPBPR converter. Uh, and that's kind of handy and cool it can be an issue if your laptop can't generate load, uh, sorry, standard definition mode. So if you can't do like a 240p or a 480i style mode out of your laptop because it's limited to how low resolution it can spit out, that can be a bit of an issue. Then in another video we looked at using a DVD or it was actually a Blu-ray encoded DVD that we played on a PlayStation and we use that for test patterns. Now that was cool, that got around our resolution limits, but the big issue there um, is it's quite painful to pop a disc in and then cycle through menu menus manually uh, while the calibration software uh, wants to read those values. It can become very tedious and you can't just do a big calibration and walk away um, and come back and see all your values, which is handy sometimes when you want to do the, the larger, what they call the full tilt boogie calibration. So thankfully uh, this company uh, lightillusion.com uh, have got this really cool little utility which they give away for free which is super generous um, now I, I'm not affiliated with these guys at all I don't buy any of their products but they uh, they look fairly comprehensive they seem to service the uh, the film and medical industries in all of their tools um, they seem to have a lot of products and even some rental options which is really cool uh, a lot of software but this is a pretty cool little product what it allows you to do is load a bit of software onto a Raspberry Pi um, and I don't think you need a particularly powerful Raspberry Pi. I've got a leftover 2B that I've just got floating around from some old projects it's kind of useless um, and, and you know I think you could probably load this up on a zero um, but what it allows you to do is use that uh, via the HCFR software and a few other bits of software um, as a remote control test pattern generator so this thing will spit out the colors you want when you uh, plug it into your laptop it'll discover it over the network and can use it as a remote control device. Now the cool thing of course about Raspberry Pis is that we can really do whatever the heck we like when it comes to resolutions. We're not limited to the sort of standard high def resolutions that most people are calibrating to today because we're retro gamers, we're using old hardware, we want to use those uh, lower end resolutions. And of course the Raspberry Pi gives all sorts of options. So um, I'll put the link in the description but you head to these uh, folks website, you hit the download button, what it does is it sends you to a registration form, you register with them, they'll send you an email and inside the email will be a link to download the image. Uh, once it's downloaded we bang it on a Pi and we run it. So I'll go through a quick uh, example of that. I won't go through the actual writing, it. you know, you can just download this Etcher software and install it. Um, you, I'm in Linux so I use DD. Uh, there's a million ways to load software on a Pi. If, you, if you've ever loaded a standard Noobs or Raspbian distribution to a Raspberry Pi, uh, it's the same old thing. So I won't cover that. There's a million videos out there in internet land that'll cover that. But what I will do is quickly show you how I set up the Pi for a standard definition display uh, and then I'll show you that in operation. Okay, so we've written the image to the SD card, we've popped the SD card in the Raspberry Pi, we've plugged the Raspberry Pi into the network and we've powered it up. First thing I want to do is get on there and change the resolution of the thing. Actually no, that's not even the first thing I want to do. First thing I want to do is update the software on it. Um, I contacted the developer, um, initially I found a bug in the software, or not really a bug, I mean they, they probably didn't consider the use case, where uh, if the image was an interlaced image, and I always calibrate against a 480i interlaced image, mostly to do with the fact that when you calibrate a 240p image, the scan lines uh, can sometimes fool the sensors into thinking that there's a problem with the, the luminance levels, the brightness levels, um, remembering that 240p is not a valid broadcast mode. Um, it's a mode that a lot of consoles use to give us a nice progressive non-flickery display at either 50 or 60 hertz, depending if you're PAL or NTSC, um, but it's, it's not really a proper uh, mode. So 480i is what I like to calibrate in, even if I'm going to play games in 240p, that's the way I calibrate things. Um, so I'm going to go and set this to a 240, sorry, a 480i output or a 576i output if you want to calibrate to a PAL standard. Now to do that we have to log on to the thing. Uh, 
have to update it to get the new software that's compatible with the interlaced image and then we have to set our mode so under this uh, update section on their website they give you the uh, root username and password for the device which is kind of a silly password I guess well whatever who cares um, I'm actually going to change it to be something easier because I'm lazy um, so what I've done is I've just jumped on my uh, server which is my DHCP server for my house um, and my server has told me that this has picked up uh, this IP here. So uh, let's log into that. Password that they've given us. All right, we're in. Simple as that. Uh, now I believe this thing runs an Arch Linux distribution. Um, and there's a few funny things about it, but I'll, I'll show you that in a sec. So first thing they recommend is running this package update command. So let's do that. Close. All right, we're going to run that. Now, I'm fairly certain this thing takes quite a while. So um, I might just cut to the end of this update process. So, you know, run this update. Uh, once it's updated, reboot it. Um, maybe run it again if you're unsure if it finished and then we should be on to the next part. All right. Okay, so the update process finished. Uh, took a really long time, took like half an hour. Um, I've got a pretty decent internet connection, but I am in Australia and I think these are pulling updates from Italy. Um, and I don't think our connection to Europe is so good over here. Anywho, um, that's done. Uh, so I have done the updates, I've rebooted. Uh, okay run the updates once more to double check everything's kosher and sure enough we're good to go. So now we're up to date we've got the right software. Um, I contacted the author on the forums uh, and informed them about this interlaced video problem um, and the author got back to me very quickly which is very very kind of them. Uh, told me to run the update process which I've done and then mentioned that um, in order to change the config text now, if you're familiar with the Raspberry Pi, you'll know that the config text is the uh, configuration file that the Raspberry Pi reads on boot. Um, and that can do a lot of cool things like set video modes, uh, audio modes, all that kind of stuff. So what I want to do, now you, you can do whatever you like. What I want to do is I want to push a 480i mode out of the HDMI device. Um, and later on, I'll show you how I connect that to my TV through a, con a converter. It's got a DAC on it that converts the digital signal to an analog signal. For now, I have to set uh, those items. So the author gives me a couple of hints here to go follow. Um, and I do that. So there's the file I want. Go edit that. This is a standard uh, config file. So uh, what it does by default, it just sets the um, HDMI device to be the default device. Now you can go and set this up so that it pushes out of the native um, composite out if you like. Um, that would probably be a valid way. I haven't tested it. I assume it works. I'm going to do is I'm going to find these options down here and I'm going to change those. So I'm going to comment all those out, paste in some options that I've tested earlier. Uh, so here's my config. I've just got this little note here for myself. Uh, there's a special option, this HDMI pixel encoding option. Uh, and what I want is over, so um, digital HDMI supports different color encoding. I want RGB over digital as my default out. Regardless of what my converter box or my DAC does, I want to be feeding it full range RGB and then that box can do whatever it likes out to the to the uh, screen. Likewise, I can change in software whether I'm sending full range or limited range on the fly as long as I've got full range coming out of my HDMI device. So I've got some options here. These options are all uh, documented on the Raspberry Pi website. Um, so you can go and have a look at what all these things do. So these, these are your SD TV modes if you want to set uh, your composite out. But I'm actually going to go and set a HDMI group one. 
what does that mean? Uh, scroll down and find it. All right, so there's two modes that the Raspberry Pi can spit out uh, via the HDMI port. Um, there's the CEA modes, which is mode one, and the DMT modes, which is mode two. So very loosely speaking, CEA is a uh, television standard, and DMT is a um, PC monitor standard. So you can sort of see that, like if you look at these resolutions and modes that the device supports, um, you've got all these sorts of notations, right? These 480p's and these 1080i's and whatever else. These are all sort of common TV modes. If you scroll all the way down to uh, group two, you start to see these more sort of uh, PC style notations, right? So if you if you hooked up a PC monitor, um, you'd use those. So what I want to do, um, I've got my two modes selected here. I've got mode 6 and mode 21. Mode 6 for me is uh, 480i 60 hertz at 4 is to 3. So uh, that's basically NTSC television mode. And then mode 16, no, not mode 16, mode 21. The other mode that I chose, which is 576i at 50 hertz. So this is my power mode. So depending on what I want to calibrate to, I mean, I've said this before, I'm in an Australian territory, which is a PAL territory, but I almost exclusively play North American or Japanese games, which are all NTSC. So I calibrate to those standards, um, mostly because most of the games that, were, that I play were designed in North America and Japan. And so when I play them in 50 hertz, a lot of them aren't. Um, change for speed so they slow down so I prefer to play them in their sort of native format on occasion I will play some PAL games if they were designed and developed uh, in PAL territory so anything you know a lot of the uh, British games um, mostly the micro computer games or your Amigas and those sorts of things I'll tend to play those in 50 hertz but for most of my console stuff certainly 99% of the stuff I play in my Mister, I'm generally playing um, in these North American and Japanese standards. So again, as I said before, I calibrate in 480i. Um, that's mostly so that I don't get those thick scan lines and that doesn't throw off my probe and it gets all these sort of luminance variances across the screen. Um, it, it calibrates just a little bit better when I'm calibrating in 480i. And then afterwards when I play and I play in 240p, those pictures uh, are much nicer. So here are my options. Uh, anything with a, uh, a hash in front is obviously commented out. Um, so uh, this is the default config which I've commented out. This is just a little note for myself to remind myself what the heck's going on. Uh, mode 6 give me this 480i. Uh, HDMI pixel, pixel coding is 2. So I'm spitting out via my HDMI, I'm spitting out uh, RGB full range, which is what I want. That's going to go into my DAC and my DAC's going to convert things later on. Um, depending, you know, if you know what you're doing and depending on the DACs you use, you can certainly change these things to whatever you like. However, again, I like this because then I know what's coming out the door and I know that I can change things in software later on. I leave this commented out here um, simply because if I want to switch between the two, it's just a matter of uncommenting one or the other. Once that's done, I write and quit. So um, I'm using uh, BI or Vim here as my editor. Um, if you use that, you know how much fun that is. I run the bootloader command. So what the bootloader command does is it um, grabs all the boot configuration stuff, including this file that I've edited, and pushes it all to the right place. That takes a few seconds to run. And once that's done, uh, sync to flush disk and reboot. So that's that. Um, I'm going to now head over to my display. I'll show you how I set it all up and I'll show you the thing in action. So I just want to quickly mention too, when we calibrate devices, we always care about the accuracy of the devices we're using calibrate with. So um, we've talked about the probes and colorimeters that we use and, and their accuracy levels compared to very expensive devices. Um, and you know, the, the question too is that when we, we want to spit out test patterns that our screens and our probes are going to use to, to calibrate, we want to make sure that those signals are accurate too. We're calibrating to the wrong thing we end up with picture clearly um, so uh, just on the AVS forum this individual here who uh, was very kindly tested a whole bunch of different options for calibration including a couple of uh, DVDs some some video footage a whole bunch of things over a whole bunch of different devices and then compared the quality of the output which is cool um, so, you know, there's a, a few media discs and things that they tested that came out pretty good. Um, I don't know what this mobile forge is, I'm not sure, but this is over uh, 
uh, 8-bit component uh, 444 connection. They found a bit of inaccuracy here. Delta E's of sort of up in the 4s, um, which is kind of not so cool, I guess. Uh, this one was terrible. I don't know what this was. Way off. However, uh, I am not very interested with any of those. What I am interested in looking at this uh, P generator, which is what we're looking at today. Um, so this individual tested it, found that uh, at the RGB4, which is what we set our output to be, uh, was a delta E of zero flat, which is excellent. It's literally perfect. You can't ask for better delta E than that. And this is across their full test range. So they're testing uh, across uh, greys, blacks, skin tones, blue skies, different, uh, you know, 100% colours and, and moderate colours, which is awesome. Absolutely awesome. Um, they did some more tests when it came to different combinations of output, um, so whether or not you tested RGB limited out of the RPI versus uh, RGB full out of the RPI and then setting your calibration software to manually only test the limited range, uh, and that didn't come out quite as good. I mean, it's still good, right? Delta E3 peak at this 90% uh, gray, but for the rest of it, pretty much bang on the money. Um, so I guess, you know... <laughs> The message there is don't set RGB limited out of the Pi. You know, your calibration software to change your limited output, but set your Pi to be RGB full. Uh, and then likewise, I think they tested with uh, the YCBCR. So YCBCR is the digital version of YPBPR. Um, so that's sort of when you know when you code DVDs and things like that in that digital color space. That's the color space you use. So there is a um, a matrix multiplication that happens to get from RGB to YCRCB um, and outside of the analog space and digital space you will end up in um, uh, non-integer numbers, floating point numbers, so floating point rounding errors and things like that factor in, a bit of inaccuracy. So again, the message of the story here is that when you are running this in RGB, full 8-bit, full range, uh, super, super accurate for us. So we're going to stick with that with all our testing that we do. Rightio, over near the TV, uh, my giant mess of cables, which I'm sure uh, every retro gamer has in their collection. Uh, there's my Mistar with IO board. Uh, that normally goes into my uh, component switch and out to my giant TV, which sits here. Got my PVM over here. So we've seen those two devices calibrated in previous videos. Um, however, this time I've got my Raspberry Pi network cable. Um, important that this thing's on the same network as whatever device is controlling it. There are options for Wi-Fi and things like that. I find just plugging a cable in a bit more reliable. Um, HDMI out of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, that goes into this DAC that I've got here. Um, it's a pretty cool little DAC. It's got uh, VGA and uh, component options on it. Um, so different ways to get output out of it. So I'm just using component here with just some crappy old RCA cables I found. Uh, online, it's got um, digital optical out too, which is kind of nice. It's a pretty good quality little device. I think I picked it up for about like 30 bucks or something off eBay. Um, someone on Shmups recommended it. It's pretty cool. Um, odd little thing in that it, it does require external power sometimes, not always. Um, the Raspberry Pi doesn't seem to push out enough power over HDMI to power the thing. Um, so I've just got a uh, 5 volt USB plug that plugs in the back of that to give it the juice it needs. Um, yeah, sometimes HDMI does power it, and if you're getting power out of your HDMI, sometimes you need to unplug the power. If there's two sources of power, it freaks out a bit. So anyway, that's by the by. Uh, component out of that thing uh, goes into my component switch, and then into my uh, enormous 31-inch CRT. So let's fire this up um, with the Color Monkey attached to the laptop and see what that looks like. Okay, so I've, I've rebooted back into Windows. I've got my Color Monkey attached uh, to the screen. Um, as normal for my calibration, it's plugged into my laptop. Um, the the Pi's booted up. It's going through the DAC as I showed you, uh, but it just comes to a black screen. So what I'll do uh, before I do anything really interesting actually is reboot it, just so you can see the process. So hopefully the camera picks this up nicely enough. Uh, now when my DAC doesn't get any sync, it makes that sort of funny picture and then into the standard Raspberry Pi rainbow and boot up screen and uh, then it just goes to a black screen ready to go. So the, the DAC I have 
It doesn't do any scaling, it doesn't adjust the picture or anything like that. Um, as you saw previously in the configuration, it was told to spit out 480i, so 480i is what it's doing straight off uh, from boot. So, uh, let's take a look on the color HCFR side of things. So, as normal, file new, I'm going to do a new calibration. Uh, we did a video earlier where I calibrated this exact TV uh, using the DVD manual method. You remember me stepping through manually very slowly and painfully on that particular video. So, hopefully this will illustrate why we want to bother with this Raspberry Pi test pattern generator. Um, so let's pick automatic here. Um, I've got my color monkey as always. I've got my refresh based display uh, because it's a CRT. All right, and we are uh, fired up in our usual interface. So uh, click on this little uh, generator configuration button over here. Um, and we've got a couple of different options. Now normally I pick this GDI full screen mode. You've seen me do that in previous videos probably. Um, so that's using the HDMI out of my laptop um, and not out of uh, any other device. I'm going to just select Raspberry Pi here. Uh, I'm going to set it to uh, 0 to 255 uh, just for the sake of this video. You can choose whether you want those different uh, ranges, limited or uh, full range. Um, and I don't think this has any uh, effect on the picture. Um, when you When you use your laptop, to display a color, it'll display the color triplets. Um, I think the Raspberry Pi does that by automatic. Um, however, I'm just going to leave that there. Um, and then we'll see this thing in action, hopefully. Um, so, uh, I hit OK. Uh, I've got it selected on our Raspberry Pi. I'm going to do my usual grayscale uh, value, a read. So we see that the Raspberry Pi there um, is being told to do something. It's got some information that popped up on screen, which is uh, cool. Uh, now, you don't have to feed in any network values for this. The Raspberry Pi, it, the HCF uh, software will um, scan the network broadcast, find the Pi and send information to it, as long as it's on the same network, which is uh, really cool. So here it is running through the colors. As soon as it's got the reading it needs, it sends information um, over the network back to the Pi to tell it to flip over to the next color. And again, remembering when I was doing this with the DVD method, this was taking forever. Um, what you didn't see because I cut it out was me making a bunch of mistakes where I'd flick over before it was ready or, you know, all sorts of silly things that I did that really annoyed me um, that made me had to reread values over and over again because I was being a bit of a goose. So... Um, that's it, that's it red, which is kind of cool. Now you remember this display that we calibrated uh, when we did it via the DVD method, we came up with these same sorts of values where the green was too high and I couldn't do much because I haven't found the RGB secret menus for this thing yet and that hasn't changed. Um, still looking, I might uh, ask some people who are at this uh, secret squirrel CRT menu business if they know the, the magic buttons. Uh, but all the same, we can we can do other colours too, right? We can do our, our red, green, blue values. And again, you see this quite quick, right? Like this, um, when I was doing it by hand, was taking ages. Go through those colours really nice and quick. Now, the one thing that I find uh, with this pattern generator, which can get a little frustrating, is that if I... Yeah, it comes up and tells you when the end of sequence is uh, done, which is nice. If I try and do something while it's in the middle of another command, I kind of lose connection to the Pi. Uh, end up having to close my HCFR software and I have to um, sometimes reboot the Pi. It's a bit frustrating. So always worth waiting until it's finished. Um, likewise, you know, if you do a, a continuous read, so if you do this sort of thing where you want to bring up a colour and read it continuously, uh, you'll see my display flashes every time it's taking a sample, uh, and then you want to adjust something. You want to go into a menu and adjust a particular colour. Uh, when that's finished and you hit the stop button, really ensure that everything is stopped uh, before you decide to go and select another cycle. Um, otherwise things can get a bit wobbly and you've got to start again. But if you're patient with it, um, it's certainly a little, hell of a lot faster than doing it the DVD method. Uh, so, I'm going to leave this here because this isn't um, a calibration video, this is just demonstrating the Pi. What I will do in future videos, however, is I will use this Pi in conjunction with a uh, voltage amplifier that will 
amplify the RGB voltages to the correct level for a arcade CRT. So um, that's kind of a tricky thing to do because arcade CRTs, they take sort of uh, TTL level voltages up in the three to five volt range uh, versus, you know, standard SCART broadcast or uh, VGA equipment, which all takes voltages in the sort of 0 0.7 to 1 volt peak range. Um, so, yeah, trying to get a signal out to a arcade monitor that I can calibrate against can sometimes be a little, little bit tricky. But this uh, Raspberry Pi with a DAC coming, uh, being controlled by the laptop software um, is going to make that a whole bunch easier. Uh, and, you know, there's cool options there too. Like I can send exact arcade mode lines through the Raspberry Pi's um, custom mode line configurator if I want to. Um, you know, there are options as well, which makes this a super, super flexible uh, option for you to calibrate against. Anyway, uh, that's I'll leave that video there. There's, that's enough said about all that. Hopefully that's another option for you to use. Really nice to be able to use a super cheap Raspberry Pi. Um, as I sort of demonstrated, third parties who are um, quite knowledgeable in this stuff have done accuracy testing and they've, they've verified this to be quite an accurate method of generating colors um, to test against, which is really cool. So uh, thanks for watching and I'll catch you all in the next video.